Now, sometimes he didn't pay it himself. He got his rich friends to also pay. But the bottom line was, when Jacob Schiff was on your board, you never had a deficit. The way they would have a board meeting of any organization that he belonged to was they'd have a board meeting, the person would say our deficit is, let's make this number up, $50,000. Schiff would write on a piece of paper, I, Jacob Schiff, will give $15,000 towards the deficit. Then he would pass it around and everybody fill in how much you're going to do till we get the $50,000. And since these were people that were his business associates and people that wanted to be on his good side, he was usually able to raise the money just from the board. Uh, now, there are two kinds of Baal Tzedakah, two kinds of philanthropists. One is the guy who says, I write the check and leave me alone. The other one is a person like Schiff who actually would go down there with his mother-in-law, with his wife, with his son and with his daughter and like help the people. He would go down there if they had a program, you know, you can you imagine Jacob Schiff like uh, serving the food in the line or, or, or whatever, handing out the balls at the playground. But this was his nachas. He loved to do it. And in the summer, he brings all the little kids from the Lower East Side that were associated with the Henry Street settlement, he brought them to his summer home in New Jersey. And they give him a vacation at his summer home in New Jersey. And, and that was his, his, he enjoyed it very, very much. Did the ship give his house after his death, which became the Jewish Museum? I think that the Jewish Museum was the Guggenheims. Guggenheim. The Guggenheim. They were also rich German Jews. Um, in any event, Schiff would go down there to the Henry Street Settlement and schmooze. Now you have to understand there's a tremendous social difference between the German Jews and the, and the, and the Lower East Side Jews. Schiff was a Republican. He was a capitalist. He was an arch-capitalist. But the story is told that he loved to go schmooze with them. And there were a lot of the Jews on the Lower East Side were socialists. And one time he got into an impromptu debate with a labor leader down at the Henry Street Settlement. And I guess one spoke Yiddish and one spoke Easy German. That's how I would define it. And they argued and they were throwing Jewish verses from the Bible, psukim, at each other. Because the socialist wasn't so religious, Schiff wasn't so religious. But the socialist went to Cheder when he was a boy, and Schiff went to Cheder when he was a boy. So they would, Schiff would quote the Bible on his side, and the socialist would quote the Bible on his side, and the people enjoyed it very much. Now I want to get to something interesting. And this is something that you may not even begin to realize. The Jewish Theological Seminary of America was started in the 1880s. Why in the world would Jacob Schiff have been the main supporter, the main underwriter, the main funder of the Jewish Theological Seminary when he was a member of Temple Emmanuel? The answer is, and you have to know, that the Jewish Theological Seminary would not have survived in its first 40 years had it not been for German Jews like Jacob Schiff who belonged to Temple Emmanuel and other Reformed temples. So the question is, why? First of all, when the Jewish Theological Seminary was founded, it wasn't a conservative seminary. There was no such thing as conservative Judaism. It was an orthodox seminary, but it wasn't a yeshiva. It was much different than a yeshiva. In a yeshiva, you don't have any secular studies. You just study Talmud. You just study codes. And the main language of instruction, especially in those days, was Yiddish. The seminary never taught in Yiddish, not from day one. It always taught in English. Maybe some professors had to talk in German because they didn't know English, but never Yiddish. And it had a, a varied curriculum. It was patterned on the seminaries of Germany and we'll call it Middle Europe as opposed to Eastern Europe. And here is the question, or here is the, the thing. Schiff and his people believed that if we are going to keep the children of the immigrants from becoming communists, anarchists, 
socialists, we have to modernize orthodoxy and we have to give them an American form of orthodoxy because they're not going to join Temple Emmanuel. A Jew from the Lower East Side who would walk into Temple Emmanuel would feel very, very strange and not too comfortable there. So let's meet them halfway and find, we'll call it an enlightened orthodoxy. So here is the question that I don't know the answer to. Some people said the Reformed Jews who were supporting the seminary actually intended for them to eventually become reform, but they knew it might take a generation or two. The others said no, they didn't have such a, a, a plan. They simply felt that you had to find a way to Americanize Judaism and they were more than happy if they didn't join Temple Emmanuel but they would be reasonable Orthodox as opposed to foreign Orthodox. Um, I, I have a feeling to the controversy about the Jewish, the Orthodox open up the Jewish. That's later. At this time in the 1880s, 1890s, all the way to 1920, you have to understand that the conservative movement hadn't really become a separate movement yet. I would define it as very liberal modern orthodox. And with time, it moved. But it, they didn't call themselves conservative. They called themselves orthodox. Or conservative in the sense that I can be a conservative Republican or a liberal Republican, but it does, I could still be a Republican. So, the whole idea that it was a different movement than Reform or Orthodox didn't come about until a little bit later in, in Jewish history. Um, Schiff did not believe in Zionism. He thought there was absolutely no future to Jewish settlement in Palestine. He thought it was wasted money. Towards the end of his life, after World War I, in his last few years, actually, he gradually, well, let's say after 1900, until 1920 when he died, he gradually changed, very gradually, and I have to give all the credit to one man, Solomon Schechter. Solomon Schechter was the head of the Jewish Theological Seminary. Schiff was very enamored with Solomon Schechter. Solomon Schechter used to spend a lot of his time, shall I say, being nice to Jacob Schiff because Jacob Schiff paid the bills. And sometimes he and his cohorts, Louis Finkelstein and Henrietta Gratz and other people who were involved in those days, were very, but among themselves they made fun of Schiff. They said he's an ignoramus who thinks he knows everything. Just because he has money, he tells us everything how to do it. But they never said that to Schiff's face because he always wrote the check. And Solomon Schechter sort of won him over, and towards the end of his life, he helped the Zionists a little bit. But I want to skip to something different called the Galveston Plan. The Galveston Plan was something that I have a personal interest in because that's how my family got to America. In the 1880s and 1890s, there were, and the 1900s, Jews came without restriction, relatively, compared to later. By the hundreds of thousands, they came to the United States. But then, uh, the American people said, there's too many immigrants. We have to cut down immigrants. And Schiff was very worried about this because he knew that there were millions of Jews in Tsarist Russia who had to get out. He didn't think that Palestine was a location for them. He thought the United States would be the best place for them. And he was willing to bring them to the United States, but he had a meeting with the commissioner of immigration the gentleman who was in charge of immigration for the United States in Teddy Roosevelt's time.